then again, they can say, no, dad, I don't need you to solve anything. That's okay. Just listen and we're good. And you'll, you'll cut, you'll get into a routine with your kid, with your kids, and they'll come to a better understanding of where you're at. And it opens up the dialogue even further. So, um, you know, I say this initially as something that works well for dads and daughters because I have two daughters. All right, Chris Lewis, my man, the author, blog founder of Dads of Divas and a ton of other efforts. We're going to get into that today. Uh, I have a quote here from the beginning, and this is more of a concept or a piece of advice idea right from Chris that he talks about a lot is that for any father that you spend as much time as you can at the level of your son or daughter, that this will produce dividends. Chris, can you let us know, let Feel Good Fathers know what this is all about? You know, for me, what I've come to find, and this is something that I've talked to men from many walks of life and that have fathers, that have, or that have sons, that have daughters, and in talking to them, the most successful that I have found in building those strong relationships have started from a very early age to when I say be on that level, I mean, when your child's a toddler, you're on the ground, you know, you're playing with them, you're engaged with them, you, you're building that relationship with them from day one. You know, you are doing whatever you can to be able to show them that you are present, that you are engaged, that you're interested and that you want to spend time with them. The more that you can do that, it builds a lot of trust and it builds a much stronger relationship as your kids grow. And as your kids get into those tween years, those teen years, you know, that's important. And that's really important that you've built a strong foundation to be able to support your kids through those teenage years as well. What are the common traits that show up in a father that get in the way of this activity? What have you seen throughout your years of working in the father community that tend to show up? I know I certainly have my opinion, uh, but what are the things that you see? I think for me, one of the things that sometimes gets in the way is, uh, is work. There is a, a societal norm of the male as breadwinner. And that's changing in some aspects now that, that there at in many families, you're seeing, um, equal, you know, equal breadwinning in that regard of, of both, uh, parents bringing in money to the home to be able to support your family in many different ways. Um, just seeing more men that are staying home with the kids and, and that's different where it's not that way. It's not the way that you, you would have seen 10, 20 years ago where, where that wasn't always the case, but it is becoming more accepted and more, more, more normal for seeing things like that. Have you, um, seen, have you seen some of the data points here? Um, this is a compare, this is from the new fatherhood of Substack, which uh, recently read some of this data, I believe it was based on a Gallup poll, but the first piece was, now, one in five parents that stay home, one in five stay-at-home parents is a father. So stay-at-home dads is like hugely on the rise. This is significantly different. I think it was like one in 20 in like 95, like a huge increase. And then, but the, the most, I think, telling piece of data here was that idea of fulfillment. So in 95, men in general identified much less with this fatherhood role. They identified much less with uh, the purpose, the joy, the happiness of being a father. Today, actually, you know, it was a couple of years ago, I think it's uh, between 17 and 21 was the second, the second follow-up survey, but it's almost a 50-50 split now that the men are making and taking as much purpose and fulfillment from that role of fatherhood as the mother is uh, in her role of motherhood. You know, I hadn't seen that, but uh, but anecdotally, through the fathering community that I've been involved with for the past 15 plus years, I have seen more and more of that happening. And it, it's a really positive thing. 
it's a really positive thing to see. It's a positive thing to see society changing in many different ways because, you know, fathers are so important in the lives of their kids. I mean, not only does it help to really build the child's emotional uh, well-being, but on top of that, <clears throat> so so often y- children are looking to their dads for not only that feeling of security and emotional and physical security, but at the same time, they're looking for for to their dads to be able to help them. And it, and studies have shown that the more engaged a dad is, the better language and cognitive skills, the better that the communication skills. And but, but again, it goes back to communication, not to say that that the mother's role is diminished in any way because it isn't. I mean, and studies have shown that too, but a family that has two engaged parents are going to allow for their child to have higher, not only higher IQs, but also higher EQs um, to allow for a kid, a child to be able to, um, to, to really set themselves up for success as they enter into school, as they enter into, you know, as that your their tween teen years are going to be, uh, they're going to have better self esteem and self awareness. Uh, so much is predicated on that early engagement, but also at a, the, the an engaged mother and a father. Because dads, fathers play so many different roles. You, you know, they they they're they're motivators. They work with their their kids to be able to act as a helper and a coach and a friend. Um, they're, they, they also help to enforce the, as, a, as a part of a team in being able to not only enforce the rules, but set the rules, but also to work collaboratively with their, uh, the partner in their life to be able to be consistent in those. They're, they're, they definitely encourage their kids in so many different ways. And, um, and that's an, an important part for them to play. Um, dads train, uh, you know, they, they provide knowledge, they provide skills, they, tr- they help their kids to be able to, to learn skills that will help them in their lives. You know, they, they listen, you know, dads, not men are not always the best listeners. Um, but I think that the more that men can, listen without making judgments and take that step back, especially, you know, I'm a father of two girls and I've talked to many men over the years. And as we, you know, as I've talked to them, so many men are ingrained, it's ingrained in them to solve problems Mm -hmm. and we're solvers and we're not always the best listeners. So when I talk to women, when I talk to men, many times the ones that have learned the most are ones that take that step back and are willing to sit in the moment to listen and to not make judgments, but just to listen. You know, one, one woman that I interviewed for the Dads with Daughters podcast that I, that I host, um, she said to me that one of the strongest things that you can do with your daughter is when you're sitting down and you're having a conversation with your daughter, and this could happen with a spouse or a significant other uh, in your life too, is to say, is this a listening conversation or a solving conversation before you get too far along? Because otherwise, a lot of times in our brain, we are hardwired to think it is a solving conversation. And a lot of times with women, that's not what they want. And it's not what they need. They need someone to listen, to take it in, and to not respond. Because they just need to talk it through. And they need someone to listen and hear them versus trying to come in with the cape on and being that savior hero mentality of I'm going to come and solve this problem and make everything better. I think, I think I want to add here uh, just a, just a little piece on this active, on this listening and active listening. Cause I think there's, there's one model, which is 
what I would describe as the stoic listener, fully intent, fully attentive, nodding along, just kind of being sort of the wall that the person can talk to. And I feel like that has a, a I feel like that's kind of like the 1.0. That's kind of the thing that we've always been taught. Uh, lately, I think this idea of reflecting or mirroring back information or resummarize, if you're, and, and this really comes from uh, modern, like argument, uh, not even modern, modern uh, ar- argument techniques of steel manning what they're saying. So if you're in an argument or discourse with somebody and you disagree with them, one of the best ways to engage in that dialogue is not to just butt heads emotionally and pounding fists for those that are listening to the audio version, but to actually say, ah, you're saying such and such, and this is your, this is the perspective. And so like a summary or a reflection in, in however you want to summarize it, but not like in a you, you, you pointing finger kind of way, simply in a, this is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Am I hearing you appropriately? And I, and I think that there's extra technique there of, sometimes to just be the one receiving the information from the spouse or your daughters or your sons or or from anybody around you. But then on occasion to say, hold on a second here. What you just said, Chris, was this this conversational skill about listening. And I wanna and I want to understand that what you just mentioned is that what she is really looking for in the spousal relationship or in the daughter's relationship of the father or the husband is to receive the information and not jump immediately into problem solving. So as a modeling technique of re-summarizing the conversation, that can sometimes give um, not only make you still feel like a participant, not like your contribution isn't necessary, but I feel like in that world, it really makes them feel way more surrounded by the intention and care because you're articulating, this is what I've heard. And then either connect corrections or discussions can be can be done. And when that happens as well, you're not coming out and just saying, Hey, you stop. You stop talking. Am I solving your problem or am I just listening to your problem? By just starting with a summary first, then it opens that space, I think, for that query of, hey, what's the purpose here? What's the, mm-hmm. what, what's the, how, how, how can I support you here in this role? What, how, what do you think about that, Chris? No, I, I, I agree with you. I think that more and more, uh, being able to reflect back that, shows active listening and it allows for the person to feel uh, not only validated, but also it allows the person to feel like you're on the same page and then they can respond back because I could say, I could say something, reflect something back and they be, and they might say, no, that is not what I meant. And that's not what, I am, that's not the way I'm thinking, or that's not what, you know, not, that's not what this experience did for me or whatever it might be. And and that's important. You know, it's important to understand that by reflecting back, you're offering the person that you're talking to. And this is, this is stuff that you can do at work. This is stuff that you can do in the home. It's stuff that you can do out in the workplace. I'm, I'll be honest and say, I am not always the best at it. And I think it's important to, to say that you're, that there's, that you may be fa- faulty in, in some of the things that you do. And I am, but I think that all of us can be works in progress. And if you're willing to try and you're willing to show the people around you that you're willing to try, they're going to offer you some grace in the, in, in giving you that grace to be able to make mistakes. Um, when you forget to validate back or when you forget to not come into the conversation with that solving mentality, the more that I think that you do what you said or you do what I said earlier, where you go to your kids and say, am I, am I listening to this just to listen or am I listening to solve? You're giving them that out and you're giving them an opportunity to reflect back at the beginning especially if your kids are a little bit older, they're going to look at you like you're an alien and probably be like, what the heck is dad doing now? And, and, and that's okay. You know, you can just say, you know what? I, you know, I, I was thinking about it and, and realizing that a lot of times when we're talking, I come in trying to solve whatever problem you throw at me. 
And I know that that's not what you always need. So I'm going to ask you when we're having these conversations, whether this is a, a, whether this is just a conversation where you want me to listen or a conversation where you want me to have my brain thinking about solving this problem, because then again, they can say, no, dad, I don't need you to solve anything. That's okay. Just listen and we're good. And you'll, you'll cut, you'll get into a routine with your kid, with your kids, and they'll come to a better understanding of where you're at. And it opens up the dialogue even further. So, um, you know, I say this initially as something that works well for dads and daughters, because I have two daughters. I've not tried it with a son because I don't have a son, but it doesn't mean that it wouldn't work with a son. But a lot of times the conversations and the, that you have from when I talk to other dads with sons, it, it's, it's different. And the way in which guys talk and guys reflect back is different. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes not as deep as the conversations that you have with women in your life, daughters in your life. Uh, should it be deeper? Yeah, I think it should. I mean, I think that too often our society makes men feel like they need to stay surface level and not go too deep because then they're showing their vulnerability. And, and that can be an issue and that can be a problem because if people truly aren't sharing their full selves with others, then you really don't know the other person and you don't know what else is going on. And I think a lot of men have on maybe one hand, the number of people that they feel that they can be truly authentic to. And women are a little different in that way. They don't, they don't, uh, they may have more than that. Not every woman, but they may have others more that they are willing to go a little bit deeper on or uh, deeper with in that regard too. Something that I thought was, um, cause we can, we can, progress down this path because you've you've been in this for a little bit uh you've been building this father community for the better part of 15 years and or more <laughs> and you've seen this progression and so i have two two core elements here is what was the community size when when did the explosion happen if you know when when did you see that there was a what i would say is a exponential ramp there's usually like a critical mass in the size of the community where it just kind of exploded and i'm kind of interested in that time frame because maybe we can reverse engineer some things that were happening in the world to kind of make this a little bit better like make this more acceptable this father community and then on the second piece i'd love to hear your reflection of what's happened over the past 15 years for this role for men fatherhood uh dad dadding <laughs> you know from from okay let's let's time it it's you know it's 23 right now so 15 16 years ago was what 2012 right okay so what what was it like what what are the changes that you've experienced and seen in supporting these communities so um i started dad of divas in 2007 and it actually i started it because i was going to be a father of my second daughter and my wife came up with the name and decided because she's like, you're going to be a dad of two daughters. So why don't you call it dad of divas? So at that time, there weren't a lot of dads that were out there in writing. Um, I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed kind of, and I wanted to have a space because I saw women sharing their experience as moms. And I'm like, well, why, why aren't dads sharing their experiences as fathers? And so I ended up jumping in at that point, started sharing my experiences with my first daughter and my second daughter was born. And we started sharing more about, about fatherhood, about family, about life, um, at dadofdivas.com. And over the years, there were, there has been a shift more and more. I found more and more men joining this dad community of men who were out there willing to, to, to write, to share their experiences. 
I mean, it's not the same as what you see within the mother, the mom community. The mom community definitely is still larger, and um, and and there's been ebb and flows. So I've seen, you know, men that were writing back in 2007. I'm probably one of the the, the few ones that are still out there, still writing and still producing content. Uh, many over the years have stopped because their kids have gotten to an age that now they might be in college. They might be adults. I've got kids. I got my oldest that is going to college this fall. So, you know, my kids are getting to an age where again, they don't want me talking that much about them anymore. Um, and I have to keep that in mind as well. So, you know, sometimes the, the writing that happens on these sites ebbs and flows as well. And you might talk more about lifestyle or you might talk more about, you know, instead of just things happening within your own household, you talk about more general topics of, of fatherhood in general. Now, over the years, one of the things that I did find, though, is that though there was this core group of dad bloggers, dad, this dad community supporting dads and writing about fatherhood, that just in general, men are not the best at creating community and maintaining community within themselves. And there's lots of reasons for that, much of which is based on the way that men are raised and much of which is based on the way in which men are, um, that the, that society values that type of, again, vulnerability, engagement, and such, and not just going to the local drinking establishment, you know, and watching a game. That's part of it, you know, and, and finding ways to be able to bond on some common, common piece. But there's also an importance to being able to have a safe space where you can talk about things that are important to you, that, and you can go and be non in a non-judgmental way so you know over the years one of the things that i noticed that was missing was some communities like that where where you could go outside of this dad community that i was in where i felt like people were very vulnerable they were sharing lots of different things and but again it closed community so back in 2017 2018 I decided to start a, a a Facebook community called Dads with Daughters, and I did it because I was at a I was at a conference where Facebook was there, and they were talking about Facebook groups, and they were talking about the power of building community. And I said, you know, there's not a lot of groups out there for dads with daughters. So organically at that conference, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start one right now. So I kind of jumped in with both feet, learning as I went. And uh, organically, it started to grow. I started to invite all the dads that I had been spotlighting in Dad of Divas because I have I had a series called Dads in the Limelight where I interviewed dads and talked to them about their own experiences in fatherhood. So I invited the men that had fathers to that. I invited other friends that I knew that had daughters. Um, that's where Brian Anderson and I knew each other. Actually, we knew each other professionally, but then I knew he had two daughters as well. So I had him come on and start helping me with dad, with dads with daughters. So Facebook really put a lot of, of effort into building communities in, in groups. Um, for a few years, they had this huge campaign called More Together. That was all about, you know, all of us are more together when we build community together and when we all work together toward a common goal. And this Facebook actually came to Brian and I back in 2019 and said, we want to, we want to ha do a commercial about your group. Now, at this point, we were a little less than 10,000 members, all of which had grown kind of organically, you know, not only through people we knew, but snowball, kind of snowball sampling. Where I think, I think I'd like to just pause it for a second because 
a lot of people today would look at that number, 10,000 people, and be like, that's nothing compared to what you're seeing from influencers and stuff like that. But, but honestly, when, if, we're going to, if we're going back in time, there's a handful of milestones I want to highlight for the listener because this is stuff that we don't think about. 2007 is about a year, a year and a half after Facebook had its major public release and went like majorly viral. This is also the, that year is also very famous in time when Facebook said, we own everything that you're putting out here. And there was a huge backlash from the artist community, very similar to what we're seeing today with, with the likes of like mid, mid journey, Dolly, all the different uh, AI generated image issues. And so at that time period, as well, you had mentioned, hey, I was seeing a lot of moms doing mom groups. And I was like, oh, there's going to be these mommy bloggers, which have been around since blogging started in the 90s. And then um, and then I think a lot of this really came to the forefront with the advent of, you know, I mean, this was kind of really when 07 as well was when Facebook went to mobile. That was kind of the other big, big, huge. Um, I think that was it. I think it was that year. It was either that year of 2012. Um, so, so just to kind of put a frame for people that 10,000 fathers in those early years compared to today, that's a, that's a huge deal. It's a, it's a big deal. And above and beyond that, it's way before any of this new ideas of fatherhood and emotional intelligence and vulnerability from men and fathers and sort of this new concept of how to show up as a more complete person outside of the traditional uh, provider and protector role for men. This is all in that time period. We're, we're talking with somebody that's at the vanguard. We're talking with a, a trendsetter here. Uh, so please continue. I, <laughs> I wanted to acknowledge you for that effort and provide well, appreciate it. For, for those that are well, listening. And, and, for, and, do, you know. and, and do keep in mind that this group started in 2018. So, I mean, there Got was it. a period of time between 2007 and 2018 where I was just, I was doing my stuff. I was sharing my stuff, but I came to find back in 2018 that really, one of the things that I, I felt lacking was a true connection to other dads with daughters. And I felt, you know, there is a unique bond that happens between a father and a daughter that's different than a father and a son, mm. you know, and some of it goes down to the fact that we are, um, you know, we've not had the same biological ex experience. You know, we're not the same gender. And we have not experienced the life in the same way that they have or will experience. Um, but we still have to support them and have to help them in the journey that they're on. So as I was talking about, Facebook came to us in 2019. They said to us, hey, we want to create a commercial about your group. Now, to be blunt, Brian Anderson, who also has been on your show, and I thought that it was spam at first. We thought it was like the you know, the prince from Africa offering us millions of dollars. <laughs> and so we, we didn't, we were like, should we respond to this? And, and we had, should, we did respond, thankfully. And, and it was legit. And they actually, they actually brought Brian and I and our kids out to New York City to, to film this commercial at Yankee Stadium. And the commercial was great. It was about two dads bringing their daughters to their first baseball games. And, um, and again, the top, the, the, the whole campaign was about we're more together. And you saw the two dads meeting in this Facebook group, um, about their daughters. Well, as I said, so at the time in which the commercial went live was about May of 2019. And the, we were at, at about 10,000 members at that point. And the commercial launched in May and went until November of 2019. During that period of time, we went from 10,000 members to about 120,000 members. So exponential growth, huge ramp up of things that we had to do to be able to support, not only support all of the new members, but also make sure that we were maintaining the quality of experience that we wanted individuals to have. So during that period of growth, you know, we, we did what we could to be able to not only, not only create a, a community where men could be vulnerable and shutting down people that were detracting from that. 
and we still we still do that. We still try to make sure that someone can be vulnerable, share things that are concerning to them without someone coming back and being like, you know, you're, you know, you're a blank because you're saying this or, you know, shaming them in some way because that does nothing but detract and it does nothing but uh, but break down the community. So for us, I I love this. I love this because a lot of our instincts come from right protecting our offspring from say the dark forest the 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 thing the the animal like really it's like it's the animal and maybe the local town community but today um there's so many more the threats are often invisible and so i had another guest mike forrester uh both mike forrester and brian's uh interviews will be down in the description where there was an online predator and I've talked a lot about with my daughter about protecting the house and being very discerning when interacting with people online because it's a moniker. It's a handle. You don't know who's behind uh, who's behind that handle. You don't know what their intentions are. And it's very much I, I always think about that uh, scene in Bruce Willis's surrogates where they're walking around with these robot versions of themselves. They're all kind of safe in their home. And there's this one interaction where it was a. Uh, a, a female bot, but it was a male at home acting as the female bot. And so um, it's a, it's just, and that's just one, one example, but the core idea is that when we're face to face, it's a little bit easier to determine the intention of that person. But when it's online, it's a lot harder to determine that. And, um, and above and beyond that, if you're doing what you need to do out of uh, passion, love and care, by sharing your concerns, by sharing the things that are happening with you and asking for help and advice, that's far more courageous to say, this is something I'm going through. I don't know how to proceed. Will you help me? It takes a heck of a lot more effort to reach out your hand and say, I'm looking for an olive branch than it does to um, criticize somebody for whatever state it is that they're sharing. So thanks for that Thank example. Please, no, no, please no, definitely. In, in, and I, I should probably step back and say, what all of, what, all of which... All of what I am saying right now is not a commercial for Facebook. Totally. It is because <laughs> there have been numerous things over the years that have been challenges with the way in which Facebook runs and the way in which Facebook supports members um, or does not. And But I just bring our experience. So one of the things that I think that has gone right with Facebook groups is that over the years, they continue to Facebook or meta continues to look for ways to be able to support groups and support engagement within groups. And one of the things that recently, more recently that they've done is allow for individuals to post anonymously. And, and I think that that's, that was important in many groups like this. Because of the fact that there are topics that men would not typically open up about. And because of the fact that they would be concerned, that they would be shamed, or they would be laughed at, or they would be, or some other form of ridicule. So the addition of allowing for individuals to post anonymously has allowed for individuals that are not willing to take that complete vulnerable step of putting themselves out there, to still put themselves out there without the fear of attribution to themselves. And As for the feel good father, Chris, what are off the top of your head super quickly, what are some of those things that you've seen? that people would post anonymously about. And this is from the guise of, for the feel good father listening, that there are people, even if you're dealing with something like Chris is about to share, that are willing to help you and are willing to listen and are willing to either be a sounding board or even provide advice or help you in some way. What are those things, Chris? You know, there's been a number of different ones. And I think, you know, I think back and some topics I'm like, wow, yeah, that's, that's really deep. And then others are not as deep in my opinion that I, I, you know, so there's this variability of what someone feels is 
you know, is concerning to them enough that they would want to use that feature. So, for example, I mean, you might have one individual that's having a challenge in a co-parenting relationship because um, they're having um, big issues between themselves and their their ex spouse, partner in their life and how they're co-parenting with that individual. And they, they want to talk about that without the feeling of feeling of shame or maybe yeah, there was an example of a father who's found that their daughter was sexually active mm. and were concerned about their daughter's safety, but at mm-hmm. the same time concerned about how other fathers have talked to their daughters about that type of situation. Because you could probably think in your own mind that it might be something that you might automatically, you know, your animal brain might kick in. Mm-hmm. And what you have to really, and, and many of the comments on that post were, you have to take that step back. You have to go in calm. You have to be able to express what your concerns are without the animal brain kicking in and you completely shutting down the relationship that you have with your daughter. I got to imagine, I got to imagine in that scenario, your daughter is already not sure how she feels about what's happened. Uh, In the same way that your son, probably after their first sexual encounter is probably already not sure how they feel about what just happened. Uh, These are, I, I think that's one of those, huge milestones that fundamentally changes a person is when they start becoming more sexually active. And so uh, coming in, as I would say, coming in hot, <laughs> that's what my, my wife tells me. She's like, don't go in hot. <laughs> it's like <laughs> coming in hot in that situation is uh, it's not really paying attention to and being present uh, as you were saying earlier, reflecting, mirroring, being present uh, engaged and interested in what's happening with your, your children. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I mean, some of the situations that are shared anonymously are ones that in your own life, you're going to experience in different ways. And and parenting isn't, isn't easy. You know, you, you don't come into parenting. There's not a handbook for every parent that is the right way to parent. You know, there's lots of books. But no book is completely right. No book is completely wrong. But what you have to end up doing, it's like all of the conversations that I have with fathers. I do it. I do these conversations with, with dads in, on my blog, in the podcast, you know, in the Facebook group. You know, I, we, we encourage this discussion because the way that I see it, the more that you and I talk together, the more that not only we learn about each other, but the more that we can learn about different ways to be a parent, to be a father. Mm -hmm. And there's not a right way. There's not a wrong way. Well, there are some wrong ways in my opinion, but, (laughs) but, um, but that being said, you can always learn more positive examples of what fatherhood is, what, what fatherhood looks like. And, From that, you can take the things that make the most sense, set aside the things that don't make sense, and be able to then move from there to allowing you the ability to be able to create a new vision for what fatherhood looks like for you and for your kids. And one of the one of the challenges that we face in society is, and I guess specifically not society in general. But American culture is the rugged individualism and the focus on the individual that is that American dream. Um, as I've said, the iconic, the Marlboro Man, the you know, I'm an 80s kid, so the 80s and 90s action movies, that kind of stuff. Uh, contrast that with other 
I'm going to say specifically countries that have a much more communal or commonwealth ideal. So as a Canadian American, I grew up in Canada, there's much more of a sense of a commonwealth. We don't even have to go that far to experience it, um, especially for us, us Michigan folks. Uh, <laughs> so I think that in that, in that world, what I, what I like about that is that I think there's two things that I want to react to here. The first being you do as an individual have that right to determine and figure out what's correct for yourself and your family and how you interact with them. That's the, that's the feel good of feel good fatherhood. You're making that decision based on inputs, but it requires that inputs. It requires communities like what Chris is discussing and, um, and it, uh, putting together and also this curiosity of figuring out what else is out there. Is this the best way? Which is that personal development Kaizen perspective. But I always try to remember and I always try and encourage other fathers is that our role is to make a functional adult at the end of the day. Our role is to help these other individuals, sons and daughters, enter the world in a way that they've got their, they at least know how to stand. I was going to say get their head on straight, but that's not, that's not the appropriate, that's not the way that I want to say. It's they know where to stand. They know where they stand. And so they're able to make decisions for themselves. Are they able to at least move through life knowing that you have their back? What, um, I back a little bit to community because I think this is, it's really critical here. You mentioned very, very early on that we're not great at maintaining communities. And I think, um, in our, in our closing element here, what are things, what are things that you've seen that you've been able to, with the support of this great platform, foster these great communities and um, interactions between men in these fatherhood groups. Uh, I think you hinted at maintaining standards of the community. What are elements that in this world that wants to pull us apart, that wants to separate us and really move us towards that rugged individualism side? What are things that we as men and as fathers can pay attention to or skills we can develop to help foster and create more either local or online communities in a way that allows the kind of interaction, the kind of standards of conduct, and the kind of what I what you're hinting at is healthy interpersonal relationships with everybody around us. It's not an easy thing. And I think that one of the things that I mean in our community, because it's as large as it is, one of the things that we have we have people that volunteer and and what and we moderate every post and make sure that people are being civil and we have specific rules that are in place within those communities to make sure of that because we want people to be able to share themselves but we also know that you know this community is not a like the dads with daughters community our dads with sons community you know these are not communities to bring in your political beliefs. This, these are not places where you come in and you you bash women or you, you know, where you're, there's other places where you can go and other groups that allow for that. But like in our group, we don't. We, we say, you know what? Yes, you can have a, a really poor relationship with your, your ex and we validate that and say, we get it. It's hard. But this is not the place where you come and bash them because this is, this is a space for dads with daughters. And, you know, that ex person in your life was a daughter at one point. So we are uplifting women in our dads with daughters group and uplifting all women in that regard. We realize that there's going to be situations where you don't have a positive relationship. And in some situations, but that doesn't mean that that should impact your relationship with your daughter. Mm -hmm. Now, I think within your own, if you're looking to start your own communities on a Facebook or some other platform, you need to be very clear from the very get go, what the vision for the group is, what the rules of the group are, what your standards are of decorum, we'll say. And then you have to stay consistent about the enforcement of those as well and call people out if they're violating them 
And if you have to get to a point where you mute them, you boot them, sometimes you have to do that. And, and to keep the community the way that you want it to be. Now, you'll get some people that will be like, you know, this is freedom of speech and, and I get, I should get to that rugged individualism. Like you shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be uh, saying what I can or can't say. And I say, well, this community can. Yes. And if you want to be a part of this community, these are the rules that we follow there. And, and I can say to the same person, there are other communities out there that don't have these standards in place. And you can go and be a part of those if you want to. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and I've said to people many times, you know, this community may or may not be right for you, but come in, you know, kick the tires, see if it is. If it is, love to have you stay and be engaged. And if it's not, that's okay too. And you have to be willing to understand that there's an ebb and flow that happens when it comes to these communities too. I kind of go back to the fact that in the end, though, as a man, as a father, it's important to find community where you can. And when I was talking about the fact that men are not always the best at finding community and maintaining community, that's not only online, but it's really, but it's also in person. When we are younger, when we are, when you, when you go through high school, you go through college, you build those friendships and you build those strong bonds with people. But as you get into adulthood, you maintain some, but then you really start growing apart from many as well. And you have acquaintances, but those strong, deep friendships, the friendships where you can talk about anything and everything, and be com- your complete self and vulnerable self becomes far in few when it, when you look at that for a lot of men. And why does that happen? I, I can't say that I have the, the complete answer. I think some of it is we get hyper focused. We get hyper focused on our jobs, on our families, you know, on the career that we're in. And we don't put as much time and effort into the re- other relationships outside of those circles to be able to build those strong relationships. But when it comes to mental health and your overall wellness, having those relationships in your life help you to be a better person, a stronger person, but it also shows your kids what healthy relationships can look like. And that you should have these type of friendships and relationships as you get older. And, and that's important too. Awesome. My man, Chris, I think, I think you just did a, a really great bomb of, uh, knowledge bomb of how to model, uh, great relationships, how to model great communities. If folks, uh, we've mentioned a handful of times, but if folks want to find you, get to get in touch with you, learn more, maybe even join this Facebook group, uh, where can they find you? Uh, and, and what are those, what are those, uh, addresses? Sure. Um, dadofdivas.com is my blog. Um, you can find me on almost every social media network, uh, as of dad of divas as well. Um, fathering together is the 501c3 that Brian Anderson and I, um, started. That's at fatheringtogether.org. And I've talked about the dads with daughter podcast. That's through fathering together. The communities that we have are called Dads with Daughters by Fathering Together and Dads with Sons by Fathering Together. You can find those by just going to Facebook and typing those in. There's a number of other communities that are out there, but we're the only one that is by Fathering Together. So if if you look at that, you'll find those there as well. Feel good fathers. Uh, Chris Lewis.